on my computer. We, ah, here we go. So we will open up when we are actually. Fantastic. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I will get going in just set my timer. Okay, thank you all for your attention today. My name is Adam Watson and I'll be presenting to you the proposal for universal safety. Just a few moments on the company itself. Uh, universal Safety Technologies is a provider of safety and security systems to commercial customers. Their mission is to protect people, property assets from fire and theft. Predominantly uh, focused in the US and Canada, 15 regions, 150 offices, offering uh, services regarding design, installation, monitoring and maintenance. Customers are B2B and there's 100,000 of those with average of two locations with 50 monitoring devices. Predicted growth is 10% year on year, growing to around about 100 um, devices per location in five years. Currently, they're struggling with systems that are not well integrated, leading to additional work and their goal is to create a more unified system. In terms of risks, we've identified that there's a number of customers between the different monitoring systems. So to mitigate this during migration, we need to assign a globally unique identifier. We will also be making sure this ID is synchronized into those systems on a nightly basis. In terms of design documents uh, being on laptops for open orders, this will be mitigated by utilizing the design tool as the predominant way of viewing that data. So we'll not need to worry about historical um, documents on laptops. LDV uh, has been identified as part of the solution and therefore we need to utilize archiving with, with all the off platforming files and custom indexes. In terms of geographically separate IT teams, we need to ensure we establish a COE where those representatives can play a role in the direction of the project. And finally, the desire to go live in four months means that we need to prioritize requirements uh, and define an MB MVP and front load any complex integrations. In terms of assumptions, we are presenting the optimal solution today, so there's no budgetary constraints. We're utilizing the principle of least privilege for sharing. We assume the use of an existing IDP as SSO is in place, and this is assumed to be on-prem. We're assuming the monitoring systems can support the concept of a location linked to a device and the use uh, storage of an external ID. The design tool we're assuming is externally accessible. It supports SAML and can also be used to integrate via the SDK, Canvas SDK, and also supports just-in-time provisioning with role-based access for designer and customer access. We're assuming the regulatory requirements do not extend to data residency and therefore does not preclude single org. And finally, any other assumptions we'll call out as we progress. <clears throat> In terms of organization strategy, we're promoting a single org. The predominant driver here is there's no community volume constraint or data residency as previously discussed. We can also provide a unified view of data and it has a lower integration footprint. There is one risk identified, which is the reason for the separate ERP system is due to regulatory requirements. And if this is required in the system, we can mitigate with the use of separate record type sales process page layouts and validation rules. <clears throat> in terms of multi-language, we need to support both English and French. So we're using a multi-language approach, which means we need to leverage custom labels, translation workbench for translations of those labels, visual force email templates to utilize those translations and then community content translations and language picker. In terms of multi-currency, we're assuming uh, sorry, multi-currency due to the need to operate in both the US and Canada. Moving on to actors and licenses, uh, we've identified that system specialists, of which there are 3,000, need sales and service cloud. This is due to their need in both a lead qualification um, opportunity quote and also access to work orders from a servicing perspective. Support reps need service cloud and also service cloud voice for telephony integration. Their predominant need is in the lead qualification process, but also then goes uh, into the service management process. Managers, we're assuming that they need oversight of both sales and service capabilities and also would then need Tableau for uh, uh, historical reporting and trend reporting. Contractors, of which there are 6,000 would require partner community licenses and this is driven predominantly on the need to interact with opportunities and quotes. Primary customer contacts, 
we are uh, recommending use of customer community plus and this is driven by the need for apex managed sharing and delegated external admin finally secondary contacts will be customer community licenses as their basic operation requires case and account and contact access in terms of additional uh, licenses we're utilizing DocuSign. There'd need to be a service cloud voice entitlement license for, for any additional minutes and also Twilio for SMS messaging. <clears throat> In terms of the role hierarchy, we have a headquartered role broken into US and Canadian regions where we're assuming a VP that heads the, those up. Within each region, uh, in each geography, there are then a number of regional managers who have a number of location managers reporting to them. And then there's a system specialist within that location who uh, fronts the contractor and the um, primary contact external licenses. In terms of the service aspect of the organization, there's three service centers which would report to the uh, country VP. So, so two service centers in the US and one in the uh, Canadian region, and that would then have the service representative reporting to them. In terms of our system landscape, we have Salesforce at the center with service and sales cloud. We have service cloud voice, which is backed by Amazon Connect from a telephony delivery perspective, omnichannel and shield for uh, platform encryption. And we're also leveraging two app exchange packages, DocuSign free signature and Twilio for SMS. In terms of our external custom base, we have a contractor and a customer community. The customer community will integrate with a number of social ID providers uh, utilizing OpenID Connect. And we'll also be promoting the use of mobile publisher for an on uh, device experience that will utilize the user agent flow for authentication. The primary driver for mobile publisher over other forms of mobile delivery is the need for rapid uh, delivery of the device uh, of the application. We do not have any expertise of building uh, hybrid or native apps, and there doesn't seem to be any driver for um, access to on uh, device features that can't be delivered via Lightning Web Components, as we'll come on to later. There's also a Tableau CRM, which is shown for uh, enterprise reporting purposes that we'll come on to. In terms of a website, we've got an existing website where we'd uh, promote the extension in order to utilize the ESB to visualize monitoring data from public context, but also to facilitate the web to lead forms for lead creation. We'll also be promoting the use of Salesforce Mobile for internal users, specifically the uh, system specialist, as they need to work in the field. In terms of our um, IDP estate, we are assuming the use of ADFS is already in place within the organization and we can utilize this to establish single sign on for internal users. We are also showing that we're assuming that SSO is connected to the monitoring and ERP systems already. The design tool we will be leveraging, um, we're assuming is an external accessible system that's on premise and we will be utilizing Canvas in order to show the design tool for both internal and external use. In order to facilitate authentication, we will then be utilizing Salesforce as an IDP for SAML based authentication. In terms of our integration state, we will be promoting the use of an on premise enterprise service bus. This is predominantly driven by the need for orchestration, unified error handling, and also exposure of APIs to external clients, such as the website where we can utilize caching technologies. We'll be integrating with Salesforce via a different number of mechanisms we'll come onto, but predominantly we'll be using uh, Jot token authentication and then transport layer security via mutual um, SSL. The ESB will then federate with downstream systems such as the monitoring system, with which there's three of them and the ERP. We're also promoting the use of introduction of a data warehouse uh, for historical storage purposes. Um, and this will be used two ways. One is to archive data and the other is to then make it available to Salesforce via the ESB on demand. We'll also be recommending the use of a discrete ETL technology. This will have two forms. One will be for migration of data from legacy platforms. The other will be uh, in terms of both archiving data from Salesforce to the data warehouse, but also for uh, batch synchronization processes to move data between uh, backend and Salesforce systems. And with that, uh, we'll continue to the integrations. We'll, we'll cover those in context of the solution run through uh, in due course. In terms of our uh, data model, 
uh, at the core of the model, we have accounts and contacts. So these will be modeling both the customers and the contractors. Uh, they will both be owned by the system specialist and be private. We estimate 160,000 um, accounts across customers and contractors, and then around about 800,000 contacts based on there being on average six or seven contacts per account. Uh, in terms of um, capturing financial data, that is then uh, would be a custom object that will be around about 320,000. That will be private. That will then link um, to a location as will an account. So a location is being modeled as a discrete um, record dis, uh, dis, as opposed to an account. And the reason for that is it doesn't have a clear sales relationship with an individual. It represents a physical location instead. So one account can have many locations. Each account has on average two locations. That is also owned by the system specialist and will be private. In terms of the sales cycle, we are promoting the use of opportunities which will be created um, from leads, which are at the top left here. So a lead will come into the system. There's around about 300,000 of those, and that will then be converted into account contact and an opportunity. We'll utilize opportunity line items to attach uh, relevant products that are being um, made available or proposed to the customer, and then utilizing the quote functionality below in order to generate quotes um, that can be agreed by the customer, assuming here that there'll be twice as many quotes as opportunity, so two quotes per opportunity. In terms of accessibility of the quote information to the end customer, the assumption is they'll be predominantly working off a location uh, and therefore the quote documents will be linked to the location for accessibility in a community context. And this is why we're showing the files relationship. In terms of any design documents, we are introducing another custom object which will be predominantly used to front the design document that's mastered in the design tool. And that will be a master detail relationship with the location and is predominantly in place to allow um, collaboration with the end customer and will also be owned by the system specialist. In terms of um, contractors, uh, they need to sign contracts. So we're promoting the use of a contract object, uh, which will then be where the DocuSign integration connects with in order to facilitate e-signature. In terms of monitoring and um, installation and maintenance, we will be utilizing the uh, service cloud work order object of which there'll be around about 4 million, uh, which moves us into LDV, more on that in a moment. They will have two record types, one for installation and one for maintenance in order to dis disseminate between uh, installations which are related to opportunities and maintenance which could occur either on a given schedule or as a result of a case. The location object itself will be utilized to maintain the independent maintenance schedules and we'll come on to that later. Work order line items will then link to individual price books and can then also link to individual assets which are used to model the, the devices. And there is a significantly high data volume of 32 million over a five year period. Due to that reason, we're recommending that this is owned by uh, an account outside of the role hierarchy. So an API or a system account and it will be controlled by parent. In terms of managing that volume, uh, this, we can archive off any assets that are for customers that have now left the organization, but predominantly um, we don't see there being an issue as we can utilize custom indexes and also the, own, uh, the data skew is low due to the association with an account. So one account might have maximum 200 devices. So as long as we access assets in a, a rigorous way within the context of a parent object, we shouldn't be victim to any performance constraints. Finally, we then have case, which is to model individual monitoring issues, and that will be linked to an account and contact, and also will then uh, could spawn a work order for specific instances. We, re we assume there'll be 6 million per year, and then this is an object where we'd need to archive uh, as its usefulness is limited once the process has been fulfilled. So with that, we'll move on to our um, solution landscape. <clears throat> Sorry, our business requirements document. So the first um, user group we're going to look through is um, the lead qualification and sales process. So this uh, involves a number of uh, ways of creating leads, either via placing a call or via web web based uh, form processes. So in order to facilitate this, we're recommending the use of Service Cloud Voice, uh, utilizing Amazon Connect to integrate voice and route to an available agent. 
web to lead in order to manage the um, up the, in uh, creation of a lead via the web channel. We will then utilize web lead assignment rules in order to route to a specific country queue. And we're assuming here that leads will be manually picked off the queue by the sales rep. In terms of um, 5,000 prospect customers per month, uh, this is well within the limit of um, web to leads, um, 500 a day, so we're comfortable there. The support rep, once they access uh, have access to the lead, will then need to perform some pre-qualification criteria and review the customer and schedule a visit. So we'd utilize fields on the lead object to capture questionnaire answers. A screen flow is a good option for managing a sequence of questions and answers to be saved against the lead. And the assumption here is that the lead will be converted manually once it's deemed to be qualified. And this will then create an account contact and opportunity and uh, will be assigned to the respective uh, system support specialist. An event will also be created as we've shown here against the opportunity to represent the visit that will occur. Now, during the site visit, um, it needs to be mobile enabled and that's driven our use of Salesforce mobile. Videos and photos could be taken and need to be accessible from Salesforce and we can then simply upload files against the opportunity, assuming here that each file is less than 100 meg. In terms of creating preliminary estimates and sending a copy to the customer, this is where we're utilizing quote, quote, line items and price books and price book entries and the quote will be emailed to the customer once complete. And in order to capture GPS information, we'll utilize a Lightning Web component on the page layout to capture geolocation fields on the location object. The creation of estimate activities and then allows the customer to view the estimate. So we'd have a record triggered flow on quote creation when it's in review that will provision a community user if one does not already exist. The location, as we've discussed, is the predominant object where communication will occur with the customer and a flow will ensure that um, a content document link is created to the quote document and link into the location. So then the customer has visibility of that quote and chatter will then be used on the location in order for back and forth communication with the system support specialist. Back at the office, a number of design plans are created using the design tool and there are very lar uh, large files involved. They need to be available in Salesforce. So we're promoting the use of a Canvas um, integration to expose the, the web uh, front end within Salesforce. And we're assuming here that the tool allows the real-time rendering of PDF files based on proprietary data. And the design tool can be extended to support just-in-time provision of external users with relevant permissions, which will enable both internal and external users to have access to the relevant files. The design tool can call the Salesforce API using this access token in order to create this design document that represents the document. And this is the uh, page layout on which the Canvas application will be displayed. Considered integration to pull documents into Salesforce, but due to excessive data file volumes, um, the recommendation is to instead keep the data within the design tool itself. Once design documents to say are uh, created, system specialists will notify the customer um, and will need a digitally signed document. Therefore, we'll have a status on the design document to trigger an email alert to the customer. We've talked about Chatter already to collaborate. I had considered Quip, but due to it being a non-collaborative uh, non document in terms of um, the content isn't being collaborated on, it's simply commentary on a static document, felt that that was uh, not the right solution in this situation. We would then have a DocuSign button in order to send the final quote for e-signature at the appropriate point. At this point, the customer also provides financial data and we need to go through an approval process. The assumption here is that the details are provided over the phone and this is driving the use of our custom object financial data linked to both an account and a location. The recommendation here is for Shield for platform encryption in order to encrypt the financial data at rest and we would use an approval process on the opportunity, which is manually initiated in order to facilitate the, um, the level of approval required. Finally, customers should be able to use Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn credentials in Salesforce, and this is why we promote the use of single sign-on. In terms of uh, now moving on to the contracting lifecycle and installation, um, contracting records are mastered in the ERP systems and therefore um, we do not want data to be editable in Salesforce. We can utilize record types and read only page layouts for that purpose. 
In terms of daily record creation, um, with this is our first integration, which will be a daily batch sync between the ERP through to Salesforce. New contract has been automatically provisioned. We can utilize a record triggered flow on contact creation for contract record types in order to provision those users when required. System specialist selects a contractor for installation. They should get access to all of the aforementioned uh, records. And this is where we can utilize an opportunity team and add the contractor to that opportunity team, which will then give them access um, to the other relevant data that we uh, require. The contractor reviews the customer documents and collaborates with the customer. So therefore they need to go through the similar cycle as the system specialist and they'll repeat the same process as defined above and assuming that the contractor will also have a, an identity provisioned in the design tool for that purpose. Once the design is acceptable, the contractor will initiate an acceptance. Uh, so contractor would change the status of the opportunity. A record triggered flow would then create the contract which would then send the uh, document for signature. In terms of notifying uh, the system specialist on contract acceptance, we can utilize DocuSign to update a status flag on the opportunity when the document is signed, and then that will notify the system specialist via chatter. The order is then created in Salesforce and flagged as complete and sent to the ERP. We're utilizing work orders for this um, situation, a considered order, but we're not modeling the fulfillment process, we're modeling the installation, and therefore we do not want to duplicate the data. So in order to perform the integration, we will have a uh, fire and forget pattern that will send a platform event to the ESB and process by the um, uh, ESB in order to create the order on the ERP and then update any external ID against the work order uh, in Salesforce using remote uh, call, call in. Detailed order information must be available in the ERP in, in Salesforce, and we can utilize a dynamic link in order to open the ERP, which is also enabled via SSO. There doesn't need to be any inbuilt um, access to that data on platform. The ERP update status information that needs to be available in Salesforce, so we can utilize a remote call-in pattern that ERP calls the ESB, which then updates the relevant status against the work order in Salesforce. Once the order arrives at the customer's location, we need to send out communication so we can utilize a record triggered flow on that status update in order to fire an email and utilize a Twilio package in order to send the SMS. During installation, we will then need to record the uh, devices that are set up. Um, so this assumes that device registration itself allows linking of customer and location data, data and on that basis, we would then have a remote call in um, from the monitoring system to the ESB, which would then call into Salesforce to create the relevant asset linked to the location and the customer based on the external IDs. I considered external objects, um, but felt that the inbuilt asset uh, relationships and capabilities were going to be leveraged extensively. And due to the security issues with the external objects in external capacity, I felt it was not the right uh, mechanism in this situation. Once installation is final, Salesforce will update the system specialist um, and the information will be sent to the ERP for the invoice. So once the work order status is changed um, to installed, we'll have a daily batch uh, in order to upgrade the, um, the relevant invoices in the ERP from any installed work orders. There doesn't need to be any real time invoice creation as far as I can tell. <clears throat> so moving on to scheduled maintenance, um, the maintenance schedule is set by the system specialist um, and is then managed by the support staff. On average, it's uh, maintained twice a year. Uh, in terms of the data model, this would be supported on the location, and this is based on the assumption that all devices at that location maintain the same schedule, regardless of installation date. Considered field service, but felt that the maintenance requirement was relatively uh, simple and did not warrant the complexity of field service and the other capabilities that would not be leveraged at this time. When scheduled maintenance is one week away, we need to create uh, relevant service orders and we'll utilize a scheduled flow to run a nightly batch to identify locations that are a week away from their maintenance window and then create the relevant work orders assigned to the appropriate system specialist. Once maintenance is complete, uh, the system specialist will update uh, the data on their mobile device and we need to send an ERP service order in a real time basis. So on the basis of a work order being set to complete on the mobile, we would then trigger a record triggered flow that will send a platform event to be handled by the ESB in order to create the relevant um, 
service order that is near real time um, and that's assumed to be good enough. So moving on to the monitoring aspect of the um, of, of the problem domain, um, the three existing systems already perform monitoring functions and that will continue to be the case. In addition to those capabilities, we would need to raise events within Salesforce. So this is where we utilize our seventh integration, which is issue creation. So the monitoring system would call an ESB endpoint at the appropriate point. The ESB would then make a determination whether an issue should be created in Salesforce or not. I'm assuming here that not all issues warrant creation of cases within Salesforce. If it does need to be there, we'll create a case linked to an asset um, based on the latest event data. The event should also create a task for the support team. So we've talked about we'd create a case linked to the asset for that purpose. Customer contacts can then log in to Salesforce on the web or mobile to submit cases, and this can be supported via the community and also potentially linked to an asset if required. There's also a capability to scan barcodes and identify devices for which they want to raise cases. This, this can be facilitated with a Lightning Web component with JS libraries that allowed scanning of a barcode and then a lookup of the, um, of the data against the relevant asset in order to identify the case. The fact that it should be on a mobile device is driving our need for a, a more native experience, thus the use of mobile publisher as opposed to a browser-based technology. And as we've already covered, a considered hybrid and native, but there doesn't seem to be a clear driver for the complexity uh, for the needs of those technologies above and beyond mobile publisher. Issues submitted this way should be routed to the appropriate service rep, and this is where we can use omni-channel and skills-based routing. And if maintenance uh, work is needed, then we would need to uh, create a service order. So we'd have a screen based flow that would create the work order and perform a call out as there needs to be immediate feedback of success or failure. And that would then on success create the work order within the system. And that is our eighth integration, which is request reply. From this point on, maintenance work will be scheduled as previously described, which we have already covered. In terms of volumes, uh, 20 issues per year, uh, half of which are creating work orders, that's then gone into the calculation of 4 million cases year on year current volumes, but due to the year on year increase, that could then climb to 6.5 million cases and 3.2 million work orders, and that is then driving the need for archi archival of old work orders uh, within the system. In, now we move on to our data migration requirements. So from a holistic perspective, data migration uh, consists of three phases, extract, transform, and load. In terms of uh, the extract process, we need to load data from the legacy CRM, both ERPs, the monitoring systems, and also the design tool. We then need to perform a set of matching algorithms in order to identify master customer and location records and assign a globally unique identifier that we can, uh, all the systems can use to target the correct unique customer in the future. The legacy CRM leads would be uh, match the customer records and we'd then discount those leads from the data set. And finally, we'd transform all of that data into a canonical data model. The load phase would consist of the globally unique IDs being written back to the ERP monitoring design tool as they are the uh, correlation identifiers we need to use for other processes discussed. Historical data would then be pushed to the data warehouse. Uh, data would be uploaded to Salesforce via the bulk API and it would follow a route such as internal users, product price books, price book entries, accounts, then contacts, any external users, the location data, design documents, contract financial data, assets, case, work orders and work order design items. We would recommend that automation should be disabled during migration, uh, deferred sharing calculations and ensuring that we sequence the update based on ordering by parent IDs to prevent lock-in. In terms of the requirements themselves, um, the number of leads we've talked about, that, that's where we get the 300,000 and we're talking about discounting the leads that we've matched against customers that are already in the ERP. Customer and location data from different systems need to be logically linked and that's the purpose of that unique identifier which can be used as an external ID. The last three years of sales and service data should be moved. Uh, this is where we would strongly recommend that that data is instead pushed to the data warehouse and made available through um, request response with Lightning Web Components to internal, commu internal and community users. And any reporting requirements would then take a feed of that data to Tableau, as there doesn't seem to be a huge driver for that historical information to remain on platform. 
all devices from the three monitoring systems need to be replicated in Salesforce and logically linked, which then follows the matching and unique identification process we've already described. Finally, design documents need to reside on, uh, currently reside on laptops. This becomes a non-issue as the assumption is the design tool will have that information and we're exposing that as Canvas. Therefore, we don't need um, workarounds such as documents on, um, <clears throat> on, on laptops or the need to integrate that data into the wider environment. It's made available through the design tool. In terms of accessibility, uh, I'm just move back to my data model. Uh, system specialists should be able to view and edit all customer installed data. So they would be the owners of an have access to account and asset is controlled by parents. So they'd see all assets for that account. System specialists should be able to view all customer installed data for other specialists. So we'd need an ownership based sharing rule for the system specialist country group within the whole uh, role hierarchy. Uh, and, we're, and we don't want to give them access to financial data, which is one of the drivers for keeping financial account as a segregated object that is, remains private. All managers should be able to view and edit all customer and install data for their respective locations, including financial data. This would be role hierarchy based sharing, but we'd need to enable hierarchy on any custom objects such as financial data and location. Contactors should be able to view and edit data for locations to which they've been assigned, except for financial data. So we've got an opportunity team member to give them access to the opportunity, but we would also need to utilize a number of Apex managed shares, for example, on the location um, in order to provide uh, access to that data. Customer contacts should be able to view and edit their own information and installed system data. So we'd have a sharing set based on user account and that would then enable the user to get access to the account and any associated objects. Certain customers have multiple um, customers in different locations and need to be supported within a hierarchy. And then they should see all data and subordinate data across the um, related accounts. Promote, we're recommending the use of Apex managed sharing and considered external account hierarchy, but the hierarchy is really only going to take care of the account and related um, master detail data for the account. As we have a number of custom objects that would need visibility as well, this is then driving the need for Apex managed sharing in those situations. Support centre reps should be able to see all data within their geography, and this is where we can utilise a criteria based sharing rule based on region. Uh, in terms of US and Canada. So on to reporting requirements. Support representatives, system specialists and managers need to run reports on sales activities so we can use standard reporting uh, on opportunities and events. Uh, system specialists and managers want to run reports say a number of device monitoring events so we can utilize cases created as issues and this is on the assumption however that this only represents incidents that are within salesforce if we need uh, richer data on all events we'd need to utilize tableau managers should be able to run ad hoc uh, trending reports to show level of monitoring Due to the need for ad hoc and trend based reporting, this is a good use case for off platform reporting with historical data from the warehouse, and this is why we would utilize Tableau. Customer contacts should be able to run reports showing issues and status of issues. They can utilize the case list view for this purpose, which represents the status of an issue. And uh, finally, a report to run from the live public website. Um, this is where we'd use an ESB integration uh, to expose any monitoring data via the ESB, and that can be retrieved from the data warehouse uh, as so as not to put load on the monitoring systems. We'd also recommend the use of a cache at the ESB um, for this purpose. We're assuming here the website can protect client secret in order to enable server to server communication. I want to cover some additional integrations that are not mentioned. Um, so integration 10, the customer location sync, this is in order to create new customers and locations within the monitoring and ERP apps, specifically for being able to then link devices in the monitoring application. We want those customers to already exist with the external ID, which then facilitates the device creation process. In terms of archival, we'd have a data archive process driven from the ETL to move data from Salesforce into the data warehouse and purge it on a periodic basis. And finally, we'd need a request response pattern, uh, an ESB endpoint that can be called by a Lightning Web component in order to display historical cases, work orders, et cetera. 
In terms of um, moving on to the environment strategy, uh, sorry, the project and governance requirements, we talk through the need for multi-language, which we've covered already. In terms of geographical separate teams, we need, uh, and they've already dealt with a great deal of autom autonomy, we need to ensure that we establish a central COE. Um, a COE would look something like the following, which is um, an exec sponsor, uh, which is the primary responsible individual for the programme that would then sit on a executive steering committee who would then have um, responsibility for a programme owner that would head the COE. The COE itself is the beating heart of the governance structure and takes feeds from business school and technical stakeholders, architectural review, change acceptance board, any test leads for test plans, for example. And then we're showing here feeds from the ERP and the uh, monitoring support teams in order to provide a unified view of project plans and any dependency management. And importantly, there's a likelihood of compliance interaction uh, to deal with the regulatory requirements that might be necessary. And they will then provide the guidance to the work streams. IT teams have access to only one development and one test environment. Uh, so we need an environmental plan where we prioritize SIT and we utilize mocks in lower systems. So it's a good chance for us to talk through our environment strategy. In terms of um, process, we'd have scratch orgs that would relate to feature branches within Git and you test your changes on the feature branch and then integrate into the develop branch. That would then kick off an automated build on the dev sandbox that would run unit tests and potentially auto regression tests, uh, potentially using Provar to validate the build. That candidate can be then uh, taken into QA, which would be a dev pro sandbox where a number of functional and regression tests could be conducted. At this point, you could optionally create a release branch in order to um, isolate an independent deliverable through the stages of the delivery. Once it's past QA, we would then promote that release branch into SIT, and that would be a partial copy sandbox and the, inter, inter, and the environment where we'd have downstream interactions with ERP, the monitoring systems, and this uh, is where we need to prioritize that environment. We'd run a number of end-to-end -end and integration tests to, to validate the end-to-end -end aspect of the delivery. Once that process is completed, we'll move into a staging environment, which is a full copy sandbox with anonymized data from production, where we will run a number of non-functional tests, such as performance and penetration tests, and finally promote into production where there'll be a number of manual smoke tests to validate the deployment. And that is when we would take the cut of the master branch as well. There's also a hotfix route to deal with critical issues where you could utilize scratch orgs to validate a change and a hotfix environment to validate um, the fix. And then depending on criticality, you might decide to move into staging before going to production or in critical cases, deploy immediately to production. In terms of tools, we'd utilize uh, Git for source control repository, VS Code for um, in our IDE, Jenkins for orchestration of uh, environments, Provar for automation testing and JIRA for uh, incident management. The sales management team would like to simultaneously release the completed solution to all regions in four months. So we've covered that the mitigation here is we need to define an MVP due to the aggressive time scales, and then we'll be looking for a big bang approach of that across all regions. Um, we'd like recommendations on how to manage the project to priorities, the technical design issues. So we then talked about the use of our COE in order to uh, ensure that all, represent, all members of the teams are represented and can come to a consolidated decision on how to move forward with any issues. And they should we, uh, meet on a regular basis, either daily or every few days, especially dependent on the fact that the um, time frame of this project is very short. And with that, I'd like to finally end on an explanation of one of the OAuth flows that we're using extensively from an integration perspective, and that would be the JOT token flow. So in this flow, we don't have interaction with an end client, it's a server to server flow. So the client, which would be the ESB uh, in our case, would make a request to the OAuth token endpoint with a grant type of JWT bearer and an assertion, uh, which is the JOT token. The JOT token itself consists of an algorithm header, a header with an algorithm that is used for signing. There is then a body which consists of an audience, which is the login URL. So that'll be login uh, for production and test.salesforce for other environments. The issuer would be the client ID related to the connected app, which is configured for this client. And finally, the subject is the username of the user that we are going to bind to for this authentication. 
that payload is then digitally signed with a private certificate in order to create a signature that's appended and sent to Salesforce. Salesforce will then validate the signature using the public key against the connected app. And if all of the information is correct, an access token will be returned to the client, which can then be used for downstream integration with uh, AP, uh, the Salesforce APIs by utilizing the authorization header. And with that, that brings my presentation to conclusion and I would like to open the floor to questions. Thank you very much. I will pause the recording. No worries. Perfect. Okay. All right. Can you go to your org strategy, please? Sure. Okay, so I see in your org strategy that you're mentioning the regulatory requirements and that you will tackle, tackle that using different record types. So can you uh, clarify what regulatory requirements you would solve uh, with record types? How, what is the problem and how does this solve it? Sure. Um, so my, I wasn't sure on whether regulatory requirements related to the fulfillment process, which is not being covered as part of the sales source solution. But on the safe side, if, if there was regulatory requirements specifically in terms of fields that needed to be captured um, or different steps in the process that needed to be completed, that we could leverage record types uh, for the opportunity, for example, that would then control page layouts that would show different uh, fields depending on um, different different regions, that that would then allow you the flexibility to capture certain aspects of data uh, in context of, of different uh, regulatory requirements. And then in terms of sales processes, the different steps that might be required as well. Um, so that, that was my thoughts on that. Okay, okay. So it's adhering to the necessary information that you need to capture and the steps you need to fulfill in order to be compliant to these requirements. Correct, yeah. Um, so I made the assumption there wasn't any data residency requirements that would then uh, not allow us to use a single org. Um, okay, a second part that I see here, and I also saw it later on in your project uh, description is your language strategy is multi-language. Can you walk me through a bit more? Um, I see some of the details that you're using, but what are some limitations where, does this cover all the needs that we have? Um, so predominantly in terms of customer, customer translations within the community. So if we take it from a customer's perspective, predominantly they would then have their preference set against their, um, their account and that would then be used to drive the content translations that are displayed for, for French or English. In terms of their um, navigation bar that would then utilize um, translation workbench to translate the, the names of the items in the workbench. In terms of then the fields that they see on the page layouts would be custom labels driven and any email correspondence or, or SMS correspondence they got would then use the custom labels translation in order to ensure that the content is within their desired language. And what about uh, reports and dashboards? Um, so in terms of reports and dashboards, um, I wouldn't be, uh, be able to go into detail on that. Okay, next judge, please. Can I follow up here on the regulatory requirements? Just um, from a, we have a steep timeline of four months. How do you make sure that we allow that all the regulatory requirements are are fulfilled, and how uh, do you see any risks there? Um, absolutely, if there's regulatory requirements, and that's why I wanted to show uh, the compliance team being a key member of the COE. Um, so they would need to be engaged early on in the project cycle in order to highlight any potential regulatory issues early on for us to be able to plan appropriately um, to, to mitigate those risks. Okay, thank you very much. On your data model, you are using a work order and you are using a work order for the normal order as well as the, the maintenance orders around that one. So can you please justify why we are not using a normal sales order uh, compared to the work order? 
absolutely. So I saw logically them as separate entities. So the, the order is, is owned by the ERP, which is the fulfillment of the devices and has its own process that's outside of Salesforce. Salesforce needs to be responsible for the installation, which is very similar in nature to the, to the sales order, um, but is modeling um, an installation process as opposed to a fulfillment process. So instead of having an order with line items that is relatively defunct and is already within the ERP, we unify that as a work order or it's an installation work order, but we denormalize uh, fields with on within that order to map to any external identifier in the ERP, which then enables us to open that sales order uh, via a deep link. So you will use a work order to show the limited information of that order and you will have a deep link to go back into the uh, ERP system, am I right? Uh, yes, so just, just to clarify, probably one additional point on that, the work order is representing the installation um, and then you can open the sales order from the ERP. So it's, it's not there as a proxy, it is really, is adding value. And the value is it represents the installation life cycle of the order as opposed to the fulfillment. Okay, and so I, when, when exactly you are creating that work order? So the work order would be created um, on the back of the opportunity and is what triggers the creation of the sales order uh, in the ERP. Can I follow up there? Uh, what is your rationale using the work order instead of a custom object for the installation? Because it um, logically is the same process in terms of there is work to be carried out at the location, which is synonymous with the maintenance uh, and the same uh, relationships with devices that need to be installed or maintained is very similar in nature. So I wanted to unify the experience of both the contractor and the system specialist in that regard. Um, is this uh, let's assume we want to make a more budget concert decision. Uh, would you ch what can you change in your solution to make that? Uh, budget budget related decision. So am I allude is that alluding to uh, changing licensing? Yes. Um, then we could we could utilize custom objects potentially in order to, to model the same process. Um, we're losing some of the out of the box. Um, relationships and capabilities that come along with work orders but yes that is a possibility for us to, to can, explore can i follow up here what is the out of the box for capabilities you would lose for the work orders which is required here for our, pro our project so it's predominantly in regards to um, probably relationships um, which which is probably not a, a great driver for um, if if money is is an, a critical um, requirement or driver for the project so would you like to change your solution or would you stay with your solution of the, using the work order? I would still use work orders due to it being the most optimal solution uh, okay. in this respect. Thank you. I have a follow up on that. What is the implication on external licenses? If you, if you wanted to expose work order, I think you used it uh, with partner community. Is that possible? Uh, work, work order? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so just uh, just one small follow-up. So you will use a work order for just to have that kind of a sales order representation, but you will not have any work order line item, right? You are just using a work order in that context, just to be clarified. Uh, the, the installation can still have work order line items that can relate to specific um, assets that will be installed as part of that procedure, which then, um, which then drives the installation process and can be mapped to the sales order. Where are the data that you're actually allowing you to create a work order and work order line item uh, based, up, based, upon, based upon opportunity and quotes? Correct, yes. So the opportunity line items are used as the predominant source in order to create the work order line items that represent the installation view of, an, of, of, an, of a product uh, and then the potential asset that could be created on the back of that. So suppose one product having a three installation or three times need to be installed. So how you translate and how to the work order and work order lines around that one and which kind of, which cell force tools that you are using to do that. So that would be part of the, um, the, the record triggered flow that would execute when the opportunity was moved into the, uh, no, actually, sorry, apologies. That would be a manual process um, initially, though there is the opportunity to use a record triggered flow to set up the work order based on the opportunity line items at a present moment in time. 
but it would it would then have a work order line item with a quantity against each product that needed to be installed. Maybe to follow up there, like what exactly do you store? What information are you storing on the work order for an installation? So that the work order represents that the work that's going to be conducted um, in terms of then the life cycle of installation that can then have statuses, for example, that the uh, the products are ready. So that's the status information coming from the ERP that the, the information has been, sorry, the devices have been uh, delivered to site. And then the work order line item would represent um, the different device types that would be installed and can be marked off independently. Um, against the the work order uh, itself okay yeah Lilith yeah I just wanted to jump in anyway so thank you guys <laughs> so can you actually walk me through because I think maybe I'm getting lost somewhere what walk me through how you go from um, a product to then at some point an asset is being created and then we have work orders for this asset being created for the installation what is happening where and which system is driving what? Sure, no worries. I'm just gonna refresh my memory on the requirement flow. Okay, so the, um, the, the process is that the system specialist meets uh, with the, uh, the customer. They then start to plan uh, the uh, the installation uh, at the given location and they add a number of opportunity line items to the opportunity to represent the different device types that they would be installing smoke suppression smoke detectors etc they then move through a quote generation process to get to a point where they're happy uh, with the with the products on offer and they then accept the quote um, that then uh, requires um, the creation of the work order to represent the, the installation work that needs to happen and also the items that need to be um, created uh, for the uh, install. So sorry, just bear with me one. There we go. OK, so the order is created in Salesforce and once the order is flagged, so that happens after acceptance. So that is the creation of the work order. And I've, I've said here in my solution notes that that would be a manual creation process. So you'll create the system specialist is creating the installation work order and then is creating work items to represent the individual installation of the devices that have been agreed to. The creation of that work order is what will then trigger a platform event that will be handled by the ESB in order to provision the sales order, so the fulfillment process within the ERP. That process will write back an external ID against the order, against the work order to represent the ERP sales order. And then, um, and I've actually considered order as a, as a fulfillment representation, but felt that it was effectively replicating the work order in context of installation and didn't add value to the estate. So then just the work, sorry. Just, just to follow up, US2 is really following, uh, is actually struggling uh, with the non-integrated landscape and also that leading to the additional work for their employees. And as part of that one, you are actually adding a more manual work to create a work order and work order lines. Don't you think that is the right solution to go forward? So yeah, I, I would I would revise that and turn that into a, a quick action on the opportunity that would create the work order based on the uh, opportunity line items as a as a staging point. The um, the system specialist could then amend the work order as necessary and set the status to complete. Uh, which would then trigger the creation of the platform event to provision the order within the ERP. Maybe yeah. to jump in on this part. So, sorry, Vinay. No, uh, go on, go on, go on. So when you're creating the work orders and work order line items, previously you said that for these work order line items, they would be linked to asset. No, so um, because the asset hasn't been provisioned yet. So, so this is very much it. In, in the terms of a maintenance order, it could be linked to an asset. That's why the relationship's on the diagram. But in terms of the work order represents the installation work that needs to happen, but the actual asset, the device has not been yet registered. That's a latter process in the flow. So at this point, it represents the pending installation uh, that will occur and the device types that will be installed, not the assets. So on the asset, I will not have a link to the work order which installed the asset because that will be linked to the products, not to the assets. 
So there could be provision for when the asset itself is provisioned by the monitoring system in the future that could then uh, initiate the link with the work item, work order line item. But no, that's not something that I'd considered in, in the flow of the, uh, the integration at this point. Okay, sorry, Vina, you had a follow up. Yeah, can just help me actually when exactly the asset get created and how? Yep, sure. Um, so uh, this is uh, number eight. So during device installation, each device is added to the customer installation connected to the appropriate monitoring system. So the device itself is mastered within the, um, the monitoring system and it would be linked to the customer and the location, which is my assumption on the external ID being provided within that application. That monitoring system will then call the ESB endpoint and that will then uh, provision the asset and link it to the respective account and location based on that external ID. And if I'm not wrong, the device monitoring system have a data of customers and location. So that's my assumption that um, in order to register the device, uh, it would then be connected to a customer and location within context of the monitoring app. And that's actually one of my rationales for implementing a sync um, from Salesforce through to the monitoring app on a daily basis in order to provision and create customer records with the unique identifier to enable that process to continue. Mm -hmm. If we follow up this assumption and assume that the monitoring system does not know about the customer, how would you then? Okay, so if the monitoring system did not know about the customer, um, then one option would be to provision um, the assets up front within Salesforce. So create the assets that are linked to the work order line items with a unique identifier and then create them within the monitoring app. And then the um, installation process was connect the um, the asset to the device that's been installed. And then you would know by association that that asset already was linked to the customer. Good. Martin? I wanted to understand about the Canvas app. Uh, can you talk me through how are you connected to the um, local laptops? Uh, yeah. Design tools on the, on the machine, yeah. Uh, so the design tool, um, so I'm just going to re make sure I refresh my memory to make sure I've not mis misunderstood something. So, so a custom browser-based tool. Um, so the PDFs are on the laptops from what I understood, but the, the assumption I made was is it's a browser-based design tool that it was available um, externally from the network. So installed on premise and then made available externally which is then how we can leverage it in both an uh, internal and an external capability. So that, that's a key assumption that I've made to enable that integration. Can you maybe so walk me through completely to, through the whole design as a, to the whole, we have two different sources for the design document. We have the design documents on the laptops of the, of our, the existing ones, and we have the new design documents, which are as far as understood created on the fly within the tool. Can you please walk me through the whole data flow? Yep. Sure, no worries. So the assumption I've made in regards to the design tool itself is that it holds the masters of the design data that is used to produce the PDF. So the primary driver for the creation of the PDF currently is that there's no way to share that with the customer. So you save the design as a PDF onto your laptop and then you share it with the client. So what I'm uh, recommending here is that the tool itself can be used to expose the design file to uh, a user and then has the ability to render it as a PDF on demand. So there's no then need to actually produce the PDF and upload it. You're, you're, you've got access to the actual source of the data. So there's let's um what applications on the design tool let's assume this is not a current functionality what implications on your project would that have um so there, there's timeline implications absolutely um so i'm assuming that that is an existing capability that that can be leveraged uh, to provide that that capability in a short time frame um, if that is not the case then we'd need to look at alternative options what would be your alternative options so an alternative option would be uh, we're creating the design uh, document and um, to represent the, uh, the file itself, what we could do is actually instead of just um, 
creating a design document record, we can actually upload the file to Salesforce uh, linked to that document. So then the actual PDF is viewable against that file, against that record, and you can have a chat or conversation in the same way. My main issue with that was the potential size. Um, I think my calculations took it to a thousand gigabytes um, a month if you had a, a large number of converted leads. Uh, and therefore you could implement an aggressive archiving strategy or then you would need to look at external file um, options, which then have um, security uh, implications from a customer perspective. Can you walk us through the external file storage options quickly? Yep, sure. Um, so we could utilize Files Connect um, and push it to SharePoint, for example, but then because uh, it's using um, an external data source, we would then have to consider how we would restrict um, access to those records in a community context. What what can we do to make it um, on a make a restrict access? Um, so we could do it per user, um, but then we would need to maintain a per user authentication for the external data source um, and a community level, which is which is non trivial and requires. Um, a, a, you know, addition, additional overhead. So I think that dissuaded me from, from utilizing that option for file visualization. I think if it was for only internal users, that would be a, an applicable mechanism, but due to the community user groups needing access to that data, I was hesitant to suggest that as an option. Can you think of any solution which can, which, um, can within our time frame of four, four months make a per user basis available um, while we so store the files off platform? So we could utilize something like S3 with a with a with a signed URL as an option. So therefore, we could you know control the the access to the document um, by creating a signed link, for example. That would be an option. Um, any alternative? Any out of uh, any um, buy solutions you can think of? So. Per user authentication, uh, maybe box. Okay, thank you very much. Dan. Yeah, just have a couple of follow up on that topic. Uh, how will you do the initial migration of the files which are there in a laptops and to where and which tools you are going to use? Sure. So I've I've made an assumption that due to the usage of the Canvas app to render the document that the, the actual design master file is already in the design tool. So the 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 reason for the, um, sorry, I just want to find the requirement. Um, here we go, yeah. Uh, the primary driver for the local storage of the PDF file is because there was no way to share that design file with a customer. So they were downloaded to local laptops, whereas actually the design tool should have a historical representation of the design file. And we can then utilize access to that within the Canvas app and therefore it does not require the need for a migration of those PDFs from those um, local storage locations. What if, it, what if that assumption is wrong because this particular tool might be just creating the file, generating a file, but doesn't have a store, the design tool, then what is the impact on your solution? Okay, so I think that then probably plays into the um, into the previous answer about the, the making the file itself accessible. And we would then need to implement a process by which um, design specialists could upload. I would be hesitant to suggest an automatic solution because you don't know where those files are located on the local laptops. So I would recommend a manual driven upload process using dashboards. So you could give a dashboard to a system specialist to say, this is an open opportunity uh, that does not have a design file attached and therefore you then drive the, the up manual upload on, on that basis. Okay, and also in your one of the solution, you are exposing the design tool to the external user, right? Correct. Can you just walk me through the your authentication authorization flow to get access to that tool for the external users? Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of um, one of the first things we're establishing is uh, IDP access. So the design tool will be set up as a, a relying party for um, Salesforce as the IDP and will then have just in time provisioning. So if you present a, a SAML assertion to that tool, it will then provision the user um, within the design tool. And also information in that SAML um, 
request will include uh, an indicator on profile, which would then create them either as a customer user or as a, um, as a, as a design user. So a customer user would have restricted access. They wouldn't be able to create designs. They would only be able to view specific designs. So that, that's the first step. The second step would then be um, utilizing uh, the connected app within context of, of the community, making sure that the community profiles are assigned as um, applicable profiles and utilizing sign request as the mechanism in order to transfer the context of the design document for display within the Canvas application. Yeah, so in the scenario, it doesn't talk about a design tool provides any kind of a mechanism by which you can have identity can be plugged in at either OpenID or OAuth. So that's a big assumption. And the design tool is also behind a firewall. So what are the implications in terms of a exposing that particular design tool to the outside users, external users? And also, we do not know uh, how many users we can really provision in the design tool as part of this process. Those are the risks I foresee. So what are the mitigation that you, for, you can recommend? Um, so my, my assumption is that although it's an on-premise tool, there is a, um, a proxy in the DMZ that allows it to be accessible from, from external locations. Um, if, if there are white lists um, available, that will, that will present an issue because we would then um, need to open and, and, and relax that rule. Um, there is also, yeah, the, the assumption on can we increase its scalability if that is a concern? Um, we don't know much about the tool in terms of its technical language and, and how that could be achieved. But one option might be taking it onto a platform as a service uh, that supports the language in order to increase its scalability and also then provide the additional security mechanisms that we need. In yeah. Order, in and order to follow up the four month time frame, um, how do you see the implications on your suggested solution on the four month? Well, if all of those assumptions are are proven disproven, then then absolutely there'll be a um, there'll be an impact on that four month time frame. We'd need to look at alternative options, as as previously discussed. So, what the final solution that you are going to provide? The file expose on that uh, design document object, or a file to be shown up directly from a design tool to the external users? Um, I mean, in terms of lower risk. Um, and not being able to, to validate those other assumptions that we've discussed, I think I'd have to change the solution uh, to, to upload the file, um, to make it available, uh, to make the file available within the context of the community so the design tool does not need to be used in that context. And which is the final selection for a file vol volume mitigation strategy for you? So I would go with, um, with Amazon um, S3 with, with publicly signed URLs. Can you... Elaborate on that, please. Yeah. Um, so we would we would upload the um, the document the PDF to to Amazon S3, uh, and then we would create um, uh, the we would push the external ID to the document um, the design document record. So that would stay. Then we'd have a Lightning Web component within the design document layout that would um, communicate with Amazon S3 using client credentials in order to provide a signed, uh, like a pre-signed link that then allows that customer to view that document uh, within context of the community. Is it from a system user context or a, it's the user context? So it's a system user context because we're, we're creating the pre-signed URL from a server to server flow from Salesforce to S3. We're not actually therefore needing to validate the uh, identity of the user because Salesforce is making that determination that that user can see that document and therefore uh, instigates the pre-signed URL. How does the document upload happen? It's uh, manual? In, in, in uh, S3 as well as... Uh, no, that, that, that would be from the design app. So we can still utilize the Canvas SDK. Um, when I say Canvas SDK, we, we, we know the context of the... Uh, so let me start again. The PDF is created uh, within the design app, and that would then require mm -hmm. an integration to push the document directly to S3 and then make the ID of that document available and update the Salesforce record. So how does the design app know where to upload it in Salesforce and which technology does it use? 
um, so it uses the API. So it um, it uses the access token that's made available um, via the sign request in order to call back into Salesforce to create the design document record and we'll then save the Amazon identifier on that record. But does it go through ESB? This, uh, this no, time? no. Hmm. Suppose I'm in a location record and I want to see a specific design document mm -hmm. from the canvas. So how I will go through that one? Do I need to also open up a design document record and then click on that particular link so that I can go to the canvas application? So is this presuming the original solution or, or the new or, or the revised new, solution? The revised solution. Okay, so in the revised solution, uh, we don't have the canvas um, on the document design layout so that the canvas application was previously on the design document layout to visualize the, the image or the, the, the PDF. So instead that would be replaced with a Lightning Web component that would render the PDF that's coming from Amazon S3. So you'd go to the location, you'd see a related list of design documents that would have uh, names and date times on them. You'd open the relevant record, which would then display the, um, the relevant image within the Lightning Web component. Yes, you talked about a lightning web component. We have multiple light, lightning web component in this particular scenario. So can you just help me understanding their testing strategy with respect to the LWs and what are the best practices that you can recommend? Okay, so um, first and foremost would be um, unit, unit testing of, of any appropriate um, controllers. Um, and the other approaches escape me at this present moment. Maybe um, one final question to go to the feedback, each of us, um, which is not around files. Um, can you go to your data model again? And please walk me through your LDV consideration around cases. Okay, so um, in terms of the volume that was predominantly driven from um, incidents uh, creation over a, num over a five year period, um, as in per year at, at year five. So incident cases have a limited life rate, lifetime. Um, they're created in order to facilitate troubleshooting that could result in a work order. Uh, so they are a good candidate for archiving at a later period. Um, so for example, after um, six months, we would then archive them off into the data warehouse and make them available um, via remote uh, via request response uh, through to the data warehouse, but we would not keep them on platform. Any other LDV cons um, mitigation strategies you would apply? Uh, yes. So uh, in terms of the on platform data, um, we would look to utilize um, indexing, making sure that we're selective in our uh, selectivity of those records. We could also utilize skinny tables in order to um, increase or increase the performance of read operations. Okay, thank you. I can go mm -hmm. next. Um, so can you go to your risk for my final question? So I see that for the desire to go live uh, with all regions in four months, you specify that you would have an MVP. Um, how, what will the scope of this MVP be exactly? Um, so that would, that would need discussion with the relevant business stakeholders. So yeah, scope, time, cost, if we're limited in four months, the likelihood is that they may not be able to deliver all of the functionality that's been outlined in the document. So we need to prioritize the requirements appropriately to find out the minimum deliverable, end-to-end uh, -end deliverable that's feasible in that time frame. Um, so there might be certain capabilities that are seen as, as less important at this present moment that we'd need to deprioritize. Uh, it's difficult to take judgment without input from the required business stakeholders. But are there any suggestions you would make where you know that your solution may take considerable time to set up? So Absolutely. which may be more suited for later phases? Yep. Um, so for example, the um, any telephony integration, um, the, the monitoring view on the website, you could argue is, is a peripheral um, requirement. Um, potentially the, the mobile application 
um, the mo even though we're utilizing mobile publisher, there is a lead time. And that then the scanning of the barcodes is another example of a probably an efficiency procedure that we could we could look to deprioritize uh, to a later phase. And obviously, if the design tool uh, in the old recommendation um, solution design would obviously be a be a, be a, be a risk factor um, that probably would need to be pushed further down the um, the, the the priority stack. Maybe one small follow-up. So you mentioned some of the uh, implications for a mobile publisher with regard to timeline. Can you be more specific there? Um, specifically, the the, um, the the going through the Apple and, and Google authentication um, or validation processes to publish it on the, on the Play Store or the or the Apple Store. Um, it's not you're not directly in charge of that end-to-end -end process as a customer. It's facilitated through Salesforce, so there are lead times uh, that need to be um, factored into the rollout plan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Can you go back to the first requirement, please? Where you are using Amazon Connect. Yeah, so you are using Amazon Connect, okay. And also you have a, for leads, we have a queue. Assuming that we have a same set of users, those are support representative working on a both side of the world, taking a call as well as actually working on that leads that's coming from web to lead, for an example. How will you make sure that, okay, they have a right assignment can be happen based upon their capacity? Because on the one hand, you are using a queue. On the other hand, you are using a service cloud wise. Um, so, so I'd need to think that one through. So service cloud voice is utilizing omni-channel, which is looking at the work that's currently actively assigned within that um, session to the user. And that does not include any uh, assigned work um, that is with the customer currently. So I would need to at least utilize the same um, omni-channel routing on the back of that queue in order to be able to drive the capacity between voice-based interactions and um, assignment via um, skills-based routing to the um, service rep. So we are going to introduce the omni-channel for that particular queuing mechanism for a later part of this. Correct, yes. Okay, can you just walk me through the design tool canvas over SAML flow, please? Yep. Um, so uh, the customer access is the page where we've embedded the Canvas app. Um, the Canvas app, when it loads, will initiate a um, service provider initiated um, call to Salesforce. And the Salesforce will then um, authenticate the, the user. Uh, as there is an active session already in place, it will return the SAML response directly to the Canvas application, to the design tool. The design tool will then utilize the service SDK in order to refresh the signed request in order to get the context um, of, the, of, the pay, of the page that the Canvas app is on in order to, to do whatever it needs to do for that interaction. I guess that flow was for external user, right? Um, well, internal user as, as well. So you're, you're accessing the, if you're accessing a design tool, assuming that there's no active session on the design tool, that is, it would then initiate the service provider um, flow from the context of the design tool. So for design tool, you have a two identity flows that connected, right? Two identity stores. One is the cell phones for external users and another one is for internal users is the AD. Uh, no, I would I would actually say that due to the design tool being used, and again, this is an assumption exclusively by the Salesforce um, user base, that Salesforce is the IDP for the design tool. Okay, that's clear. Yeah, thank you. I have a last question about licensing. So you went with Sales and Service Cloud for the system specialists, right? Uh, yes. So can you justify that, giving them the double? 
Yep. Um, so um, sales was driven by the need for quote and service um, was driven by the need for work order. Mm -hmm. And why you have an order in the first line? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a mistype. That, that okay. shouldn't be there. Oh. Okay, and just another question, if you go in the uh, sharing and visibility for a data section in the Word document, you are using Apex Manage Sharing, right? Somewhere for uh, customer community to uh, avoid any external account hierarchy, right? Yes. Yeah, so is there an impact on a licenses on that one? So my assumption here is that the, um, the customers that require access to multiple um, locations will be the primary customers and therefore can utilize the Apex Managed Share. The secondary customers are exclusively only have access to data linked to their account. So what is your assumption over here in that case? That, 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 that this requirement relates only to primary customers. Okay. And what if you also need to give it to the secondary customers? Then the I would need to consider making them customer community plus to um, to utilize the Apex managed sharing in that context. What's Any alternatives to the Apex managed sharing? Um, potentially utilizing Lightning Web Components to visualize the data um, that they require access to. Is, is that not a violation of the Salesforce rules? Uh, that's yeah that's why i wouldn't rec recommend it so what's the alternative um so i think it depends on the type of information that, uh, oh uh, contacts to multiple accounts is, is another option potentially yep that's fine thank you yep. i will stop the recording <laughs>